Um, Brian, if I can turn to you on a similar sort of no-go problem area, and that you know you and ICRC know for decades, and that's uh, South Central Somalia, yeah. um, which we hear is uh, gradually moving towards something better, but we know the Al-Shabaab is still occupying areas, we know there are no-go areas, and we know there are risks to your operation. Yeah. Can you say a word about what you've learned since, what was it, 1977, when you first went in there in the Ethiopia? You didn't, but your organization did, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what's, what's changed? Is it working? Uh, are the militias still uh, controlling the airstrips? All of those difficult questions. Okay, <coughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Dennis. Maybe just I, I'm not, I don't want to ag antagonise the chair now, but if I may, a, a quick comment. Um, mm. uh, you asked not to go to dwell too much on Syria, mm. but on humanitarian cor uh, corridors. Just to, to be clear, I mean humanitarian cor corridors are not the solution uh, in Syria today. Um, first of all, they're uh, as um <coughs> uh, Mark was saying, they're geographically focused. They're going to require force to um, to 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 install and. Arguably, depending on where civilians are moved out of, they can be seen as a kind of a, a tool for, for, for the military to move civilians out of one area and into another one. So what we need today in Syria, and let's be clear, <coughs> is that we need all parties to the conflict to allow unimpeded access to humanitarian workers. So it's, 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 it's popular to talk about hu humanitarian cor corridors, but really what we need is access uh, not just for corridors, but to all people in need. Except they won't agree. Well, we need to keep pushing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, moving on to to Somalia. <coughs> um, uh, at the outset, we, we talked a little bit about um, how do you get access and, and um, what are the challenges. And Somalia is a classic case in point where ICRC has been working since 1977, as you rightly point out, Dennis, <coughs> working with all parties to gain this uh, acceptance and trust. Uh, and we believe we're in a position now, including in parts of um, <coughs> southern central uh, Somalia um, to, to, to actually deliver um, assistance to those in need. So why, why do we have that? <coughs> in our view, there are um, one, two, three, there are four basic um, explanations as to why ICRC has the level of access that it has at the moment. The first one is indeed the depth of history, the investment over time. Um, now, it's not easy for organizations to, to find the finances to spend over 30 years working in the same context, but it, it's something that uh, ultimately pays dividends in terms of access. The second one is a just an absolute adherence to what we call our fundamental principles. So this neutral, independent, impartial action, which is understood by all, that we don't take sides. We're not there to be for one side or for the other side. We're just there to deliver uh, assistance to, the, to those in need. <coughs> the, the, the other element is, <coughs> and uh, here we kind of risk going into the domain of being a little bit immodest, but uh, the feedback from Somalis is that when, when an organization like ours promises to do something, it actually delivers. So they're not virtual programs where we say, look, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then we end up being stuck in Mogadishu uh, and not being able to actually deliver. But there's an efficiency related to those operations that is, that is understood and appreciated. A and the final absolutely key element is our work through, again, through the Somali Red Crescent and our Somali um, ICRC colleagues that have been on the ground um, down through the years. So when you put all of that together, um, you, you, you get a level of acceptance and trust which has led us to indeed have, have access. Um, I mean, it hasn't always been plain sailing. Um, uh, last year, we were, we were pushed out of the Al-Shabaab um, areas. Um, th the, there was an issue over um, yeah, the, the convoy operation, which we which we resisted, so we lost access. But we we maintain the dialogue. We maintain um, the um, the delivery of a response as best we can. Uh, and slowly but surely, we're now getting access to a point where yeah, uh, we're I think we're again one of the few international organisations that has has some um, imprint on the ground. Okay, thank thanks. You. Um, if I may <coughs> jump. Uh, Sarah, over to Mark for a second, and then come back to you, um, both on Afghanistan. <coughs> Two different issues, Mark. Uh, MSF was there, I think he withdrew in 2004, went back in 2009, you suffered uh, attacks, kidnappings, etc. I mean, the question I would like to focus on was something the UN doesn't do very easily, and that is withdrawal. 
when do you withdraw? When do you say enough's enough? When do you say no? The odds are too heavy uh, uh, against the needs. Nevertheless, we can't continue. What, a few words on, on that, and should we, <coughs> be, should the humanitarian system be saying no more often, which it seldom mm. seems to be? Well, uh, you ask that question as if there's some kind of algorithm, uh, you know, or formula no, where we just plug in a few, mm. uh, you know, a few, you know, context-specific facts, and out pops the mm. answer. Uh, <laughs> mostly, uh, you know, it is. There is always a tension uh, between, you know, sort of the, the, the principled members of the organization who really would say that, look, we need to draw a line in the sand here, uh, and those who are much more pragmatic and driven by that, that <coughs> humanity and that compassion of we need to be able to, to yeah, the, these people, we can still deliver some aid even if it's compromised. And it, it is in every, it, it is very, very difficult, and I think even with the benefit of hindsight, you, you it's very difficult to know whether, you know whether whether those decisions have been correct or not. And I think, you know, one one aspect of that is that when you look at it within any given context, within the specific context of Sudan or Afghanistan or somewhere else, you would say, you know, here, right here today, with these compromises, we can get some aid to people who really need it. And the problem, I think, though, is then the, what's the long term effect? You know, and and. and what does that do to you know your ability somewhere else in the world to say we're going to stand by these principles? Uh, because you know governments watch when the Sudanese government expels you from uh, Darfur in uh, March uh, two uh, March two thousand nine, as they did two of our MSF sections. You know, what is your reaction, and what does that mean for other governments contemplating the 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 cost you might say of uh, uh, you know of an expulsion? So you know it, it there it does come back to you know defending those principles, and it's a, it's a you know, it, it's, it, it's an excruciating discussion inside organizations to decide to leave uh, and withdraw aid. And I, I do think that um, to pretend that that isn't a possibility uh, and necessary from time to time, you know, we, we you know, essentially withdrew from Ethiopia in 1984 by speaking in a way publicly that we knew would be, the government would force us out. We withdrew from the camps <coughs> in Goma. Um, and yet we've stayed in other places that have been very, very difficult. In Afghanistan, uh, you know, it, it was the very clearly targeted killing of uh, uh, five of our um, five of our staff on the ground, in combination with also uh, the, the, the the Taliban at the time taking responsibility for it and saying that we were an actor acting in you know uh, acting on the side of the West and and what that even though we didn't necessarily believe that the Taliban had w were responsible. It's still what does that what does that do to your security and things like that? And then there's also just that the shock of what happened to us and saying no uh, enough. Um, but then uh, what about the choice to go back in in mm. 2009 and how do you how do you make that calculation? And again, you know, the the, 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 um, the starting point for any calculation isn't what's your security risk; it's whether it needs on the ground. You know, what what, what is it? You don't the, the kind of risk you might accept. To, to get into South Central Somalia at the time of, of famine and, and food crisis is different from, you know, some kids with some diarrhea and some conjunctivitis. It's, it's just our, our assessment of Afghanistan is that outside of, you know, sort of the, the urbanized areas of control of the, of the Western military uh, uh, and government, that the health care was largely absent um, and the needs were extremely high. Um, and I, I think what's also, it, it, it's kind of an interesting case study because I think it highlights, you know, you really, we, we, we negotiated for a long time. And, it, you know, our negotiations, as you said, I, I think, yes, you have to, they have to pay off, but it also helped that the situation on the ground changed. And I think, you know, you, you could find some parallels even in how things are changing a little bit in Somalia now. But essentially, you know, the, the armed actors in opposition to the government suddenly found themselves controlling territory that uh, didn't have health care in it and had a lot of people in it. And, you know, w what happens when that happens? And uh, what ha one thing that happens is you're suddenly uh, more useful to, the, uh, to those, uh, those very same actors than you were before. Um, so, you know, in Afghanistan between 2004 and 2009 when we went back in, you know, the, the complete, the evolution uh, uh, of the conflict where all of a sudden you had enormous swaths of territory uh, that were uh, uh, now uh, not under control of the government, not under the control of uh, the Western military forces, and where NGOs had uh, sort of had to pull back in 
uh, uh, two uh, very limited areas of functioning, and then the needs on the ground. And uh, you know, one of the questions I would raise about Somalia today is, with uh, you know, with um, a newly installed government and, uh, and the attempts now by, in, in particular, you might say the, the West uh, to bring about uh, development and to to, to help create legitimacy around that government, you know, and uh, this word stabilization that we hear a lot of, you know, what does it mean for your aid activities on the ground? Because if, as many NGOs found themselves after a while in, in Afghanistan, if all of a sudden your aid activities are associated with the stabilization agenda of, you know, of the West or of the Somali government, then you will find yourself in opposition to, for instance, <coughs> al-Shabaab. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, We've only got a few minutes left, so I wanted to ask you, Sarah, same country, if you, if you choose, or, or broaden it. The famous NSAs we keep talking about, non-state actors. The Taliban is not militarily going to be defeated. It's going to be part of a new regime, probably, by all accounts. It also controls territory, which needs humanitarian access. And there's a lot of uh, rhetoric about talking to the Taliban, but no one admits they're doing it. You've done interesting studies on this. Yeah. What, what, what's your take on that? And... Uh, and how do you see it in the case, for example, of Afghanistan? <coughs> well, you know, we, we've done studies with the Taliban. We've also done study with um, armed uh, non-state actors mm. in Darfur, in South Kordofan. The, the studies will come out in the next month. Um, and with Shabab, the study is ongoing. And I think what's coming out of the studies very clearly is that actually um, the, the, the difficulty on the side of humanitarian organizations to engage in, in these negotiations, in this dialogue with you know, armed non-state actors. And this is partly because to a very large extent, you know, humanitarian organizations don't seem to have experience in humanitarian negotiations. And you know, especially at the level of those who are on the ground and are supposed to you know, engage um, with the, uh, the belligerents on the ground. Um, but also, uh, unfortunately, more often than not, I have a you know, fairly limited understanding of IHL. That's something else that you know, comes up uh, more and more. Um, and of course, this is coupled then to the high turnover of staff, to you know, lack of understanding of the culture or the history of a conflict, which makes it all um, more complicated. But in, you know, in particular, in terms of engaging with the ANC, I think well, you know, the, the studies, particularly with the Taliban, uh, brought out was really the fact that you know a number of organizations on the ground had a, a limited understanding of the motivations, the power structures, the backgrounds, you know, the aims <coughs> of these structures, and that of course makes the engagement a lot a lot more complicated. And really, the you know, and uh, again, looking at my experience from the past, you know, there are obviously positive examples of this engagement, but I can't recall any you know more. Uh, recently, I mean, in, in again in South Sudan, we negotiated the ground rules with the SPLM, uh, and impacted a principled framework was called the principle of engagement, which again was was uh, um, signed up by both the government of Sudan and the SPLM. You know, we, we negotiated frameworks mm -hmm. to ensure that we had um, something that bound you know our engagement with the armed non-state actors. I mean, of course, you know, the, the, the ANCs cannot sign the Geneva Conventions, but you can do something like the ground rules that actually, you know. Basically, what it was was the SPLM issuing a declaration saying that it would respect the spirit of the convention. We don't really see, you know, the, the efforts of this kind anymore, you know, to, to a large extent. And part of it, you know, obviously is also, um, at least in some uh, contexts, in some countries, has been the impact of the counterterrorism legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and the, 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 the um, obviously the bearing it has in terms of, uh, you know, when, when you deal with listed ent entities like Al Shabab. Um, on humanitarian organizations, particularly NGOs, they you know may uh, be criminalized for their engagement because of the statute of uh, material support in, in the U.S. and the extraterritoriality of it. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we hear that there is some Canada and Australia as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, but I think the U.S. legislation goes a step sure. farther, mm. <laughs> more than mm. a step. Uh, we hear of some you know recent initiative. I, mean, I, I don't know much about it, but you know I heard that Geneva Call offers the possibility of signing a deed of commitment to and saying they've sure. done in Myanmar, you know, with some of the armed state actors, yeah, with, with regard to child soldiers. So mm -hmm. perhaps it's some of these 
you know, again, um, creativity and efforts that you know, we need again, but I think above mm. all, I would say, for organizations that truly call themselves humanitarian, is to train their staff in IHL, and making sure that you know, they understand the importance of humanitarian negotiations. And I'm hoping that the work <laughs> that we're doing in this can be of help you know, to, to make people understand the importance of engaging with government and belligerents when you know, negotiating access to affected populations. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian, just a quick unfair one, because I can't let you get away completely. Uh, what sure. about terrorism and ICRC? Is this complicating your life, this labelling of groups around the world stops us talking, or is it not really relevant <coughs> to you? Well, uh, or to ICRC? I mean, I wouldn't go to so far as to say it's not, uh, it's not relevant. Um, I mean, the, the, the issue for ICRC, <coughs> really, um, if we talk about non-state uh, actors, I mean, there is one of the realisations we've made in ICRC is that after 9-11, for example, with the fragmentation of uh, armed groups and the proliferation of armed groups, non-state groups, we invested huge resources in our networking to, to outreach to these groups and to explain th the ICRC modus operandi, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. To such a point that today there are some voices in ICRC saying we, we've actually done that to the detriment of dialogue with states in ICRC. So I, I think it was Sarah mentioned earlier this the increased sovereignty of certain states and this pushback uh, in terms of the, um, the involvement of uh, multilateral humanitarian organizations. <coughs> and there is a d there's now a job to be done uh, as much on the state side as on, as on the non-state side, uh, mm. I would say. Yeah. Mm. And we could both be prosecuted for dealing with them, couldn't we? Not the ICRC, but you could. You couldn't, you couldn't. Exactly. <laughs> 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 That's true. Um. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we're a bit over time, but I'll take a couple more minutes, if I can, from this sector, just to uh, <coughs> say to Mark uh, and Sarah, and then, and then you, Brian, perhaps a broad sort of unfair question. <coughs> what, what have been, what do you think of as failures of the humanitarian system, if you think back in recent years, <coughs> if, if that's the word? Where has it not worked? And is it because we didn't do it properly, or are there really new factors which need is it more of the same, or are we on the right track, or is it really not, not fit for purpose, as they'd like to say, the system? Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to make any progress on Syria. <coughs> it's blocked on Somalia and South Sudan, doesn't get into Kachin, and doesn't get into Baluchistan and Pakistan, doesn't know what to do. Um, is that just because things are difficult, or is there something, something missing there, Mark? What about you from that Ooh. list of answers <laughs> you have? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the first is fit for purpose to ask, what's our purpose? <laughs> I mean. I, I know what we say our purpose is, um, but uh, you know, there, there, if you look at our design, you might you might really question whether we're fit for, for that purpose. Um, I you know, I, I think maybe in general, uh, I, I would just say two things. One is, to a certain extent, I think we've discovered over the last decade the degree to which we were riding the coattails of a certain. A, a certain power distribution in the world, uh, you know, in, in some ways the, the, the hegemonic position of the West in some ways. And it, you know, to, uh, I don't think we saw ourselves as Western actors and I don't think we saw the, the, the um, you know, sort of the Achilles heel that that might create for us in the future. And, you know, it's not to say that everything about being Western is bad at all. We have plenty of actors who will tell us on the ground we really respect, for instance, your, your medical competence and the fact that you aren't part of this <coughs> conflict here. We can see that you actually come from somewhere else. And so it, it's not that everything West is bad, but I do think that we got caught out a bit. And I think that brings us back to the question of independence. And to what extent are we able to say that we are independent from, first, the, the governments who have said we are going to use aid to achieve our own military and political objectives, uh, second, you know, and that's, that's a very direct financial independence and to what degree we are able to say we didn't take their money and we're not doing their business here in a place like Afghanistan where they're a belligerent. Um, and then I think it's, it's also just the perception of that independence that we are, uh, you know, able to, to freely choose and, and decide upon our, our you know, and, and negotiate with actors, uh, you know, based on the need to deliver aid uh, in an impartial basis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess lastly uh, on independence, you know, the, 
it's just that perception of independence from you know a, a, a Western liberal agenda, from a, a, a relatively narrow way of thinking about what humanitarian aid is and does. And I, I think we're going to be increasingly questioned on those things over the next years. Um, so uh, for me, I, I would I would bring a lot of it back to that that issue of independence uh, in a very very broad way of thinking about independence. So Sarah, what new institutions, new approaches, or more of the same? Well, I think it'd be interesting to see how you know the new institutions can deal with this um, you know complex uh, situations in a different <coughs> way. I think the jury is still you know um, open on 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 how they will be able <coughs> to address these problems. I mean, we, uh, look at the case of Myanmar and the Rakhine crisis. I mean, we've seen a lot of discussions <coughs> at the regional level, uh, you know, in, in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. But have we seen anything different? I think the, the political challenges are the same. You know, whether it's at the level of the UN and, and uh, global intergovernmental organizations <coughs> or at the regional level. And I think some of the the regional and national actors um, will probably, you know, as they grow and become bigger respondents and bigger operational realities will face the same problems. I mean, in many ways, if we go back in time, you know, we've seen the, the most stri striking change has obviously been the creation of DHA and then OCHA. So you have a, an intergovernmental body that, you know, it, it sort of <coughs> becomes a coordinator in a context where, you know, previously the leadership was, you know, that of the ICRC, they obviously had a neutral position um, in terms of negotiating between particularly government and armed state actors. Now you have an intergovernmental body that proposes itself also, you know, in terms of um, a, a body that can advance some of, of these negotiations also on behalf of other actors. And that has, I think, changed quite a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the perceptions of, you know, who is operating in what way and what really humanitarian organization is. And in addition to that, of course, you've had a massive uh, proliferation in the number of uh, organizations on the ground. And that has been, you know, at, at um, over the last 20 years. And going forward, there'll be a lot more, you know, proposing to, um, <coughs> to engage in a different way, but I, I think finding it difficult ultimately when it comes to um, dealing with the same challenges in terms of you know the need for political solutions the need for um, uh, addressing you know the complexity in an impartial um, way uh, on the ground I, I don't think you know it's going to be any easier for for, for the new actors so called so mark some people say that the Geneva conventions are honored in the breach more than the observance today is that unfair or is there something missing in IHL and its lack of sanction what do you think well <coughs> I mean, the issue with, uh, with international law, uh, upon which I'm not an expert, but the, the basic uh, issue with humanitarian <coughs> law is that uh, even in today's modern warfare, the issue is not so much with what's in the law. The issue is more about adherence to applying, applying the law, basically, is, is what we would say. So no, the, the Geneva Conventions, in answer to your question, Dennis, they're as relevant today as the day they were written. The, the, the issue today is tr trying to ensure more respect Mm. But you asked about failures, um, mm. failures of the humanitarian system, and certainly my own, I, I still remain traumatized by the, the f our failure in Rwanda, in our, our failure, I, I ICRC was also in Rwanda, and you know, it, it got me thinking that access is, is not a goal in itself, I mean essentially, uh, when you look at it, I mean ICRC was there to, to bear witness to, to genocide uh, in, in, uh, in Rwanda. Um, when you look at um, Bosnia Herzegovina, and the, you know this concept of safe havens, and clearly again it's a complete failure. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, other failures, th th this kind of temptation to go for a short-term fix uh, instead of the long-term solution. Um, also, you know, when we look at our own failures in ICRC, we were discussing Sean and I with um, about Ethiopia earlier, and um, at the time of the Ethiopian Eritrean War. ICRC went cross border without permission from the from the government, um, and it gave us a level of access that um, provided a response at the time. But then um, we went cross border with the permission of the government in Khartoum um, from the Sud Sudanese side. But fast forward to then going back to the same government and asking for permission to to go to South Sudan um, in full transparency, as we say, and they said, "Well, look, you're not." you're not fully transparent because we know what you did uh, on, on the other side of the, of the border. So no, mm -hmm. um, uh, access is blocked. 
And we learn from that, and therefore <coughs> we now have the approach that says, okay, we don't do cross-border. We, we, we try to have a coherent approach where what we do in Syria is the same as what we do in Myanmar uh, and other places. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a final comment, if I may, on there's a lot of talk about the humanitarian system um, and the, um, the, the, the issue for us in this is that there isn't one humanitarian system uh, and it's a bit kind of misleading for us to talk about humanitarian system. I mean, we've got, we've got a, uh, an interagency standing committee system of pr predominantly Western um, uh, humanitarian agencies, but we've got this huge um, wealth of what's called non-traditional actors, which is a phrase that I particularly uh, don't subscribe to because I think if you ask the Turkish Red Crescent, you know, are you a new non-traditional actor, they'll probably say, well, you know, we've been around and active for at least 20 years. Um, but there is this whole um, <coughs> new um, uh, non-traditional people, and we don't really understand what they're doing and where they're doing and what level of access. So mm. one of the things that we're interested in, in, in having is indeed to build a kind of consensus between the the um, I mean to put it kind of I in in simplistic terms the global south and the global north and um, what sort of values do we have in common and what where do we have access and how can we how can we better work together? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. There's two online questions uh, along those lines. I'll come back to those here in a moment. But the plan now is to open up the session to Q and A. Please, three things. Na hold it. Name, <laughs> organization, <laughs> short questions, or else I'm going to have to interrupt you. So please, uh, a couple from the floor, and then I'll take a couple from online queries. So uh, please name, organization, short question. <coughs> 